Well, friends, part two. Number 11, part two. You might not know of the English uh, direct voice medium of the 20th century, Leslie Flint, but he was famous in his day. And he was an uh, excellent channel. Very clear, very good. Did a lot of stuff in public. Theatres and whatnot. Um, little snippet. There's a whole digital archives in various sites on the internet where you can hear the digitized tape recordings. Um, a Mr. Woods and a Mrs. Green uh, at a certain point in their lives, many years ago, I think uh, late 50s, early 60s, started lugging around a tape recorder and recording the sessions. So there's a big tape archive. And um, a fellow called Neville Randall did uh, a book called Life After Death where he summarizes some of those. And uh, since we, we already talked about uh, kind of fairly neighborly, uh, sociable activities and lives on the mid-astral already tonight, here's a bit more. The uh, the silence was broken by a familiar female cockney voice. Hello, Mr. Woods. Hello, Mrs. Green. Hello, Rose, said Betty Green. How did you know it was me? I didn't tell you. I recognized you, Rose. Oh, well, I must have a very distinctive voice then, mustn't I? I didn't know you would remember me. It's a long, long time since I spoke to you, you know. I would have thought you'd have forgotten. Well, apparently there was a distance of about ten years from the previous session with this woman. We'd never forget you, Rose, replied Woods. All kinds of people come to talk to you, she said, from week to week. We must get, you must get quite a conglomeration. We've still got your, we were only playing your, uh, eh? how are you getting on? Eh, very well, Rose, we were always paying, playing your tapes. <laughs> you always seem to attract a lot of people, said Rose. Whenever you come here, there's always crowds. I haven't had a chance to get anywhere near you for ages, you know. I haven't forgotten you. So that would be Rose the Spirit coming close to them and seeing other spirits. What are you doing now? asked Woods. Well, she replies, I spend quite a bit of time with my youngsters. I'm very fond of children. I do quite a bit with them. Well, not her youngsters, just youngsters. And I just like to, you know, I don't know, all sorts of bits and pieces. <laughs> I know it sounds daft to some people, but, you know, I like little quiet hours when I sit and do a bit of needlework and, oh, you know, read and all that. Are you still living in the same house? Yes, and I'm quite happy. I have no particular desire to move. Of course, you do get these people who all the time are wanting to get farther on and all the rest of it. It doesn't appeal to me that much. I suppose I get the urge once I, one, one, one of these days I'll make a shift. But why should I? I'm all right. Got a nice little place of my own. All my own interests and friends. What is your house like, Rose? Oh, quite ordinary. Quite a nice little place in the country. What I always would have liked living in London all my life. I used to think it would be nice to have, you know, get down into the country and retire and all that. Now I've got just what I wanted. I've no desire for anything else. I suppose, in a way, that's not a good thing. I don't know. People tell me you should, not, you should be ambitious. I'm quite happy with my own little place. Have you got a garden? Oh, I have, and it suits me down to the ground. I grow my own flowers and I never pick one. You don't? No, I let them stay in their own natural surroundings. And I get the greatest happiness and joy in just looking after them and watching them. They never seem to die. They are life, aren't they? Of course they are. They've got vitality and a life of their own. Do you visit many places, Rose? Oh, occasionally. I'm not one for gadding about. Don't mind going out occasionally, seeing friends of mine and having a natter. But I've no desire for all this gallivanting about that goes on with some of them. Some of them stay for a while and then the next thing you know they're off. Never see them again. They've gone off somewhere, some other place. Not for me. You're contented. I am. Some people say it's a bad thing to be contented, but I can't see that. I think it's a bad thing to be discontented. 
And yet people say, if you're not discontented, you'll never get on. You don't go anywhere, you know. Perhaps I'll get the urge to move on, and yet I don't see why I should give up what I've got already for something I don't know much about, know nothing about for that matter. People come and talk to me sometimes, you know, about different places and spheres, as they call them. It all sounds very nice, but I don't feel educated up to it yet. I'm happy where I am. What's your bungalow like? asked Woods, to get her back to the practical theme and away from her preoccupation about moving on. Could you describe it? Could I what? Your bungalow. You said, is it a house? Or, well, she said, it's sort of a small place. It's a country surrounding. It's got four rooms, quite enough for me to look after. Funny thing is, you don't ever get dirt. You know, you never get any dust. You don't have any, you don't have to go around swabbing the place all the time with a duster. It always seems to keep nice. But there again, do you know what people tell me? I can't get over this. I don't quite understand. They say you only get dirt in your place if your mind is wrong. Hmm. I'm quite content to let everything grow and do what it wants to. And nothing seems to interfere with anything or anybody. The birds come into the garden. They are as tame as tame and nobody feels they want to destroy anything. That's the marvellous part about it. Yes, it's very nice, isn't it? And then they talk about moving. But I suppose it's all right for some highbrow people who want to get on in a different way, you know. But I'm happy as I am. Why should I move? They're always on to me about I should, moves I should make. You know, they sort of start thinking about making changes. But I can't get it myself. She was back to her old worry again. Woods steered her away again. Rosie said, in your last tape you said you hadn't seen any sea. Now, have you seen any since we've been there? Back with you, I mean? I haven't seen any sea and I don't want to see any sea. Do you still go to the lakes? You said the lakes. With the boats on, she prompted. Oh no, Betty prompted. Oh yes, I've been to the lakes. I like that because it's calm and placid. There's none of that rough stuff, you know. The sea was never one of my things. Do you ever go to the cities? You said there were cities. Oh, there are big towns, as you would call them. Or even cities. Occasionally, yes, but it's also different. I mean, you don't see shops. There's nothing to go for unless you're really the city type. If you want to be among a lot of people, I suppose automatically you sort of feel it necessary to be in a city. Any neighbours around? Oh, there are people naturally who live around and about who are very much the same as myself in outlook. Probably that's why they're there and I'm there with them. We get together occasionally. We're happy on our own. And, and Yeah, we're happy in our own way. I'm quite happy to relax and be quiet. I've learned to read a thing I couldn't do much of when I was on your side. I learnt my ABC and what have you. And now I can read and get books. There are people who bring me books, and sometimes I'm able to let them have some of mine. We sit and talk and we read. And you know, this will surprise you, but I've even been to the pictures. I didn't mind a basin full of the pictures when I was on your side, and sometimes I go with a few friends. Can you describe some of those pictures? Oh yes, you can see things, for instance, that you saw on your side, pictures that you were very fond of. But a lot of them have a sort of model, I suppose you'd call it. And they're very interesting and very helpful. What are the fields and things like that? Are they beautiful? Oh yes, gorgeous. Very beautiful green grass we have. And I know it will surprise you if I tell you we have cornfields. You do? Yes, the funny thing is, you know, we don't have any seasons. Not in the same sense that you do. For instance, I've never seen any of what you would call rain. You haven't? No rain? I've never known it to be really dull either. Neither have I known it to be over hot. It's always very pleasant. Nice, pleasant, warm atmosphere. And yet I've never seen the sun. I don't think our illumination and light can be from the sun, because I've never seen it. Rose, is the grass the same as ours, or is it a finer texture? Well, it's springy underfoot, and it's very, very nice. A beautiful green. And I have been to places where the flowers are so high, oh, I should think they're a good seven or eight feet. It's like walking through a forest of them. Is it really? Rose, what do they do with the corn? Do they cut it or do they do anything with it? 
Well, no, it don't seem to be. I don't know. I've never seen it cut, yet it always seems to be there. Never seen any bread made from it? I know that's another funny thing. Of course, I don't feel the urge to eat. And when I did, when I first came here, but it was mostly fruit and that sort of thing that one had. But I suppose it is that you lose your desire for something. You realize it isn't so important and then it ceases to exist. That was almost one for my cup of tea and I still like it and have it. Now I suppose people will say, where do you get your tea from? Did you get it from some place on your side? Well, of course, it must come from some place on this side. So it must be grown and it must be sort of made, mustn't it? How do you get it? asked Woods. Do you sort of think you want a cup of tea and you get it? Well, it's a funny thing, you know. I'm not conscious. I don't go into the kitchen and put a kettle on and make a cup of tea in that sense. But if I feel the need for a cup of tea, now all I can say is that it's there. Well, that's very nice. Of course, she went on. Some people say, and even people over here, they've said that it's not a reality. That it's only because I think it's necessary that I have it. And it's made possible. But when I lose the desire for a cup of tea, which I've been used to having all my life, it will no longer exist for me. I'll tell you the honest truth. That's one of the reasons I'm afraid of going far. Rose drifted off into a monologue on a fear of moving on. Woods listened patiently, waiting for a pause to change the subject, and then he nipped in. Do the trees and things, do they flower there? Oh yes, the trees are beautiful. And the blossom on some of them is beautiful. And the perfume, the scent's marvellous. And you have beautiful music that side, don't you? Oh yes, I've seen lots of concerts and things. Beautiful music. Not highbrow, but nice, you know. Not jazzy muck, like you have down on your side, but pleasant stuff, you know. Real nice. Don't hear much religious music. Used to give me the pip sometimes. Rose, you said you did needlework, put in Betty Green. Do you still make any of your clothes? Oh, yes, I do. I made quite a few things, and people bring me the material. A very nice gentleman I've met over here. Oh, he is a nice man. He's a bit highly placed, but he visits He visits some of my friends too, and he never comes empty-handed. Oh, very generous he is. I always feel a bit embarrassed, really, because I think, what the devil can I give him? But he always seems to bring something. It's not so long ago he brought me a beautiful piece of stuff. A lovely shade of blue. It was just a colour I liked. That's for you, Ma, he says. That will make you a nice outfit. When you walk out in the country, do you see animals? Oh, I've seen animals in the fields. Of course I have, and I'm not scared of them. Over here they're gentle. It's almost as if they can talk to you. Of course, I never could stand creepy crawly things like frogs. I haven't seen any of those. And I'm told they're on a very low vibration or whatever that is. I don't know what that means or what they mean, but they don't exist here. And I haven't seen anything like gnats or flies. Oh, but I have seen butterflies, though. That's strange. I bet they're lovely. Oh, lovely, beautiful. I'm told they don't, there they don't ever die. Funny business, you don't die, you know. Nothing dies. <clears throat> when I first came here, once I settled in that, was I thought, well, how long is this going to last? You know, I wondered if it was another sort of life where you go on for many years and you get antique again. And then you kick the bucket. I wondered if there was anything beyond that. But there is no dying here. It's most peculiar. It seems as if you can go on and on and on. And then you get browned off or fed up or think you know all there is to know, all you want to know of where you are. And then you can sort of just go off into a kind of sleep or something. And then you go on to a different... Of course, I'm scared of stiff of all that. I don't want to go, you know. A lot of my friends say I should and I can't see any sense in it. You said your hair was long the last time, Woods. Oh, yes, like it was before. I had it cut. Uh, now that I ever really had it bobbed, or not that I ever really had it bobbed or anything. Have you met the Reverend Drayton Thomas? asked Woods. He came through once to us. Oh, him, I remember him. Yes, I saw a lot of him at one time. I haven't seen him lately. I think he's probably gone on, you know. On earth we used to say, Oh, poor soul and so He's gone, you know. Well, over here it's much the same, because some will come along and say, what do you think, so-and-so's gone on. And of course that means they've gone on a bit. To another sphere? Yes, I've lost a few friends like that. They've gone on, but I don't know. 
As I say, I'm putting stay put. Have you got horses there? Asked Woods. Oh, yes, beautiful horses. Can you ride? Oh, no, not me. Get me on a horse? Oh, blimey, mate. No, you couldn't get me on one. I'm very fond of them at a distance. But scared of horses I am. Always was. Fancy me galloping on a horse. What are the towns like? Oh, beautiful, I must say. Not that I live in one. But they're beautifully laid out. I would say that. Beautiful gardens and all sorts of parks and places for children, especially. And all kinds of buildings, big places where they have lectures and libraries and books and things. And places where you can be entertained. All very nice. Nothing common, nothing cheap and nasty. All real nice, classy stuff. But entertaining, you know. I've been to one or two of the theatres here, seen plays. Seen lots of famous people that I used to read about. As I never went much to the theatre. Couldn't afford it. Occasionally I'd go up to the gallery and see one or two of the old stars. I've seen quite a few here. A lot of them still do the same kind of work. Are the towns colourful? Yes, beautiful. Colourful, yes. But it depends on what you mean, colourful. I don't mean to say the houses or the buildings are all painted red, white and blue. But no, the architecture. Oh, it's very nice and varied, you know. All kinds. What does the stone look like? Well, the stone looks like, I don't know, like Mother of Pearl. How gorgeous. You would think it was made of Mother of Pearl. You get all kinds of lovely shades in it. What would you call the pavement? Much of the same kind of stone? Well, it's kind of stone-looking, but I don't know whether it's stone. Of course, that's another thing. There's no traffic. You don't get any cars, no motorcycles, nothing like that. People are content to walk. Nobody rides, no need for it, no effort, no effort in walking here. No, but you want to get to a distance. You go by thought, do you, Rose? I don't know whether you go by thought exactly. No, I suppose it is that you can sort of feel you want to go to a certain place and find yourself there, no effort. Have you woods over there, you know, lovely woods? I expect there are a lot of your relations here, yes? I mean, woods, trees. Oh, I, I know what you mean, dear. I was just pulling your leg. Of course, lovely woods. It's a wonderful place. No one need fear dying. It's something everyone should look forward to and realize that unless they've got something terrible in their mind, on their mind, or in their background. Of course, I suppose everyone's got some skeleton in their cupboard. But the average person got nothing to worry about coming over here. I mean, even the very wicked. From what I've heard, although it's very sad and probably in a sense very bad for them, you don't get lost, poor dears. They're helped and guided. They eventually come out of the dark. The average person's got nothing to worry about. I mean, I wasn't particularly good and I wasn't particularly bad, but I must say I've done quite well for myself. And that's why I don't want to change. All this business of chopping and changes, people have a mania for it. Some people don't know when they're well off, do they? Well, now you are living a life, Rose, that you always wanted to live, yes? Yes, I am. And that's why I don't feel supposed, deposed to make change. You're very happy where you are? Oh, very happy. Well, I must go anyway. Look after yourselves. I'm glad to hear all the good work you're doing. Come and see us again, urged Betty. I certainly will, Betty, dear. All the best to you, George. Once again, she kept her promise. But when she came to see him the next time, she was even happier. A great worry had been lifted. Chopping and changing seemed not to be so dreadful. Well, there's a, a very average person. Lots of people like that. Look at that. She couldn't read on earth and she's taught, taught herself to read and is reading and discussing. So people make little steps. And not interested in taking courses or going to libraries, but likes going to the theater. But you can see this resistance to moving on up. Sometimes called the second death when people disappear. They go on to the mantle plane from the astral plane, as some would have it. And uh, they just sort of fade away and go on to the next plane when they're ready to do so. But it's interesting to hear how one who hasn't got that ambition yet to do, to, uh, to watch others and accept it without really much questioning. And um, there's many people like that on the astral plane. Content without undue desires other than a pleasant life 
and a, a, a quiet life. A bit like being retired for a lot of people, I would say. But uh, who, are, who are we to judge the life paths of others? Some people are full of ambition and others are not. And uh, I suspect both paths lead to the same place eventually. Well, where shall we go now? We should go somewhere. <laughs> Let's project. I've uh, passed through, you know, like almost like a fly through, uh, a couple of uh, uh, personalities that didn't really want to interact and um, were uh, either not ready or not willing. One was the recently passed on American novelist Cormac McCarthy. I think he's still. Uh, I'm being told he's still in shock at the at his passing and uh, the beauty of where he has found himself. He often had quite a, a negative post-apocalyptic vision that, that he would uh, portray in some of his novels. And I think he's... Uh, I'm not sure if he was a, a believer... In eternal life or an atheist. I didn't know him that well, but he certainly was a great writer. And uh, I think he needs time to think things over before he wants to communicate. Okay. And another one I had a quick pass through uh, from T.S. Eliot, the poet, the American slash English poet, famous for his uh, um, groundbreaking poetry, like The Wasteland and Four Quartets. He seems to be leading a very quiet, devotional life and is not, is maybe tired of people coming to see the famous poet. He doesn't want to be the famous poet anymore. Yeah, so he uh, wouldn't raise his head when I entered where he was sitting. It was like, oh God, another visitor. I'm not saying he wasn't polite, he was just worn out from it. Too many people wanting to touch the hem of his fame, if you know what I mean. So I moved on quickly from that.
I'm sitting with Stephen Hayton, um, a Canadian uh, poet and novelist who passed on a few months ago. And um, he seems, uh, if not happy, then resigned. Um, I think he misses pursuing writing on earth and uh, knows that he can be a writer there, but somehow it's not the same. And um, Stephen's asking who I am. And I said, well, I'm a, I was a, quite a fan of your poetry and have read it online in, in the public spaces. And um, was just uh, dropping by to see how you were now that you've made the transition. And I am, of course, um, doing videos on YouTube, so this will go public if you don't mind. Oh, no, I don't mind at all. He says, uh, I'm certainly impressed with the uh, marvelous nature of this world I'm living in now. This almost miraculous uh, set of loosey-goosey parameters that the life we live here is contained in. <laughs> contained, that's, a, that's not even a word. You can't contain things here. You just can go, in, talk about going anywhere and doing anything. And I've been exploring that a bit, that's for sure. And... Uh, Reconciling myself to that, you know, Stephen Hayton on Earth is not anymore. I had uh, the, you know, the ego ambition for greater success and greater uh, sort of public uh, acceptance. But um, hard for Canadian writers to uh, get to that level. It's easier for American and British writers to do that. Um, but um, I'm getting used to it. The, uh, the uh, Stephen Hayden that lives here is uh, a different bag of kittens. <laughs> and I am working on some... Uh, some elegies for my uh, former life and some celebrations of my new life. And uh, meeting up with uh, friends, colleagues and family that uh, had already passed and uh, reigniting all those acquaintances and friendships and loves. And that's quite a task in and of itself, doing that. Especially when you're feeling small and shocked and a little wounded when you first come here, as I was. But uh, you learn to uh, reach out and uh, embrace. Not just others, but the other. I'm working on my... Uh, well, various angers and resentments at the state of the world, the world back there. I see there's no need to be like that anymore, that it's better to be accepting of the, uh, the world in all its uh, potent ugliness. <laughs> uh, I do feel challenged by that, but I'm working on it. Well, thank you, Stephen. I have to go now, running out of time, but uh, very gracious of you to spend a little time with us, and perhaps we'll come back another time. Blessings to you, sir, and thanks for the great poetry.